Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Kidney Coach YouTube channel. I am naturopath Fiona Chin and co-founder of Kygenesis and the Kidney Disease Solution. And I'm joined again today by the beautiful Jessie Anna Seville, all the way from the Kidney Nutrition Institute in the USA. She is a renal dietitian and expert in all things diet and kidney related. And I'm always grateful to, for you to share your time and be back on board with me, Jessie Anna. So thank you for joining me today. Great to be here. I love these conversations because I feel like uh, they're robust and accurate and up to date. And it's good to have all those those tools out there. There's way, way too much antiquated information out there that I feel like over restricts people and it makes their life kind of miserable. So it's great to be here. Yeah, well, I totally agree. And I love that you and I are on the same page as that. And so talking of antiquated information, that's what we're going to dive in today. We want to go back, and I know Emily and I did uh, a video about this a little while ago, but I really wanted to come back again with Jessie Anna so you can hear it from a renal dietitian because I think for me, I feel like this is where a lot of misinformation comes from when I'm dealing with patients and and um, our community in the kidney disease solution. So well, let's talk about all things potassium and potassium being probably a friend rather than a foe when it comes to kidney disease and Let's cover when you actually need to restrict it, if you need to restrict it, and what that looks like. And let's make it really scientific, factual, and based on the latest research, which is what Jesse Anna and I are going to do. So let's dive in, Jesse Anna. I'll let you lead the conversation, but let's start with what is potassium and why, in old school thinking, has it thought to be a problem related to kidney disease? So potassium is a mineral, specifically an electrolyte. So if you think about athletes and they're drinking their Gatorade um, and why are they doing it? It's because those electrolytes are needed for nerves and muscles to function correctly. So, you know, if uh, an athlete that doesn't get enough electrolytes, they're, they're going to get leg cramps, right? Or they're not going to perform as well. But all of us need those those electrolytes and minerals. I mean, one of the biggest muscles, maybe not the biggest muscle, but one of the most important, the most important muscle we have <laughs> is our heart, right? And that is a muscle. So the electrolytes are really, really critical, potassium being one of them. Now, potassium ended up on the naughty list for <laughs> kidney disease, actually rather unscientifically. Um, there was no science behind it. It was more logic in how the kidneys work that it started becoming a demonized nutrient and being pulled out of people's diets and being recommended by doctors, dietitians, lots of professionals that people with kidney disease needed to cut their potassium out. I remember when I was in school to be a dietitian, we were taught the renal diet and the renal diet was a low potassium diet. So even like in school, you're taught like, hey, if someone has kidney disease, it's a renal diet and that's low potassium. So you just kind of flood that across the plane. Now, the reason that's interesting is because like I said, there are no research behind it. They just thought, oh, you know, as kidneys decline, you know, they don't balance the electrolytes as well. And on occasion, we see these high potassium levels. So everyone needs to restrict it. You know, granted, a high potassium level is very dangerous. But what has happened over the years is uh, well-meaning organizations and professionals have perpetuated a myth, a non-scientific and unscientific myth that potassium restriction is important for everyone with kidney disease. And what has happened in that process is that it has come to be thought that potassium hurts the kidneys, which was never actually even the intent of the restriction. It was intended to not have this big buildup of potassium in the body. But when you read online, a lot of it looks like, ooh, if you have kidney disease, don't eat potassium because it's going to hurt you, when that's not the case at all. Um, <clears throat> and I know we're going to go through this in a second, but what more of the evidence is showing now is that actually, even if you have kidney disease, well, you may, some people need to be conscientious of it, but the majority of people actually don't need to restrict potassium, which puts a lot of amazing, very nutritious foods back on the menu. Mm -hmm. So let's dive into that deeper. So I love that you said potassium has been put on the naughty list. So let's take potassium off the naughty list then. So first off, I want to cover 
in the very rare cases where potassium will start with that bit. So we just get that out of the way. There are some very rare cases where potassium, with the, we're going to have this with a caveat, that should be reduced. My understanding is it's only when it's coming up on a blood test and the blood test has to have been done normally. I know if you've got a very tight tourniquet, meaning when the nurse has gone to take your blood and she's tightened the tourniquet for too long, and maybe the yeah. potassium was like the fourth or fifth blood draw that they've done, that will give you a false positive elevated potassium. Um, and then there are some other conditions that I'll let you talk to about that. So the only time my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that you would ever reduce potassium is if that's that, and that you absolutely know that nothing else like medications and other things are causing that elevated potassium. It is just due to the kidneys not being able to balance the electrolytes. And that... In my entire time of 20 years treating kidney disease, I've seen twice. Yeah, there's, it is more, I mean, uh, next thing we're going to talk about is what causes high potassium other than food. But <clears throat> really the recommendation that has come out, and I'll share some of the statements from the KDOKI guidelines, but uh, the recommendation right now is you base potassium on labs, right? So if, if it's high, if your potassium is really high on your labs, you may need a restriction. Now, I've definitely seen super high potassium levels from dietary intake. I had a patient once on dialysis who's a school teacher, and he had a really, really crummy day, an awful day. And he went home and binged on potato chips. <laughs> and when he came in the next day, it happened to be lab day at dialysis, and, and his potassium was extremely high and it was, you know, hundred percent related to that. Um, but more often than not, I honestly, I'll see some that are borderline, but I don't see lots of high potassiums. It's pretty rare. And even I'll have like a borderline high potassium for someone with chronic kidney disease and we'll liberalize their diet and add in avocados and sweet potatoes and all these good foods. And it won't go up. It'll stay right where it's at. And so, I think it's overstated, like you said, how many people really need to restrict their potassium, but there are a couple cases. So number one, if it's been high on your labs, mm -hmm. right? If it's been high on your labs, the, the first step is not always to restrict it. I always have my patients get a redrox, like you said, like maybe there was a, uh, a poor lab draw done. <laughs> so I always have them get it redrawn, but then even then you want to dig into causes. Sometimes we'll say, okay, we're going to cut potassium down on the diet just temporarily, but let's look at all the other causes for it. And there's a whole bunch of other ones. Um, and that's usually the, the approach that we would take rather than like across the board. Oh, your potassium's high must be your diet. So like, you better watch it. <laughs> Yeah. That's so let's go either. through let's go through those other potential causes of high potassium that aren't okay. done. So uh some of the other potential causes for high potassium, they can include um uncontrolled blood sugars, right? So if your blood sugar is super high or you don't have enough insulin on board, uh, so this can happen with people that have diabetes, that can be a cause of high high um, potassium levels, mm -hmm. constipation, people mm -hmm. that are very constipated all the time, they almost hyper absorb it in their guts. So that's another common cause, metabolic acidosis. Um, so that's when your bicarbonate, your CO2 level is low. Um, I actually see that a lot being untreated. We'll have to do an episode on that in the future because it's easy to change. But, yeah. um, but that one, I will see drive potassium levels up all the time. Um, there are some blood pressure meds, uh, especially blood pressure medications that I'll see will bump potassium up. Um, that's fairly common, not for, not for everyone, but it's one where like, we're like, well, why is potassium high? We can kind of pin it back to those. Um, what am I missing? Those are my, my big yeah, ones big that I ones. always. And we definitely have to do one on the metabolic acidosis, but it's interesting, of course, because if people are taking potassium out, your potassium foods are often very alkalizing and they are some of the foods will actually bring down metabolic acidosis. So that that's exactly right. And oh, I know the other one is that in some, there's been a couple of case studies done where people had their sodium in their diet so low, so extremely low, like less than 500 milligrams. They're being, you know, super proactive, brought their sodium down really low. And when they did that, what ended up happening is uh, the 
the potassium went up. And so when they normalized sodium, the potassium actually came down and it was, you know, a direct inverse relationship, super interesting case studies on that. Yeah. So something I'll also look for, because I have a lot, our patients that come work with us are so proactive. They're doing everything they can. And sometimes they're overdoing what they need to do, which causes them some uh, grief and some harm. Yeah. So if you don't know what Jessie Ann is talking about, when she's talking about sodium, she's talking about people being on salt restriction. So especially with people with yeah. disease, they've just cut a hundred percent salt out. And because uh, sodium and potassium, both electrolytes, the body to balance one will just push them up because it's trying to keep your heart regulated. So sodium and potassium keep your heart pumping and beating properly. So if you cut out too much sodium, the body has to draw in more potassium just to keep the heart regular. So yeah, yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly right. So, okay. So now we've got that it's very unusual to have hyperkalemia or high elevated potassium. Um, if we do, we make sure that we run the bloods again. If it's still high, then we look for other possible causes, being blood sugar, low salt diet, um, blood medica- blood pressure medications, those sort of things, uncontrolled diabetes. And then we would treat that versus taking potassium out because your potassium nutrient foods are so great. And I th- you mentioned this, but I want to reiterate and, and tell me if I heard wrong, but often if there's another driver, taking potassium foods out there has a very marginal effect on blood levels anyway if you really have to work out the driver and that's that's what you found that's definitely what I've found in clinic yeah and I mean that's actually a really good clinical marker for us because sometimes as you're working through dietary changes when you're working on a precision method you try something and you see what happens and so if someone comes in their potassium is a little bit high we're like okay fine tooth comb let's go through the diet let's make sure it's super like <laughs> there's nothing extra in there and then we take it out. And a lot of times I can't even find anything significant. Or if you just do a dietary recall, it doesn't match up, right? The numbers just don't, don't match up. But we'll take it out anyways. And we'll go get their labs redrawn. And it will still be high. And we're like, well, it's not your food. So let's just not restrict it. Because it's not your food anyway. So that's like ludicrous, right? Yeah. Um, but so it's, it can be a good test for us. You know, we can take it out and kind of see where things go. But a lot of times you know, what that'll prove to us. It was, it wasn't the diet to begin with. Yeah. Great. All right. So let's move into all the good things that potassium do. And why is it that you and I harp on about wanting to keep it in the diet and only taking it out if necessary, because some people are like, well, we'll just take it out because it doesn't do much. So let's, let's go through why you and I actually do like potassium and why it is important to keep it in there unless, you know, you've got a proper potassium issue. Okay, so to do this, I'm going to pull from uh, the Journal of the American Society of Nephrology, a very reputable peer-reviewed journal. I think they do great articles, and they have um, they had an article in 2022, September 2022. This is like oh, two months ago. <laughs> so most recent article. Not, <laughs> yeah, it's not an old article. I feel like this is really good, and they had a super great figure, and I wanted to go through this. Right. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, but this is from. Uh, Dr. Turker, Saritas, and McDonough, which I think are actually in New Zealand. So not, you know, kind of your guys' neighbors down there. Yeah. <laughs> under. But they have this great chart here, which uh, the title of it is Proposed Pathways Through Which Potassium Supplementation and Potassium-Rich Diets Can Help to Reduce Cardiovascular and Kidney Disease. So they're actually making the claim in this paper the potassium is a nutrient that can actually help prevent kidney disease. Like mm-hmm. that is so mind blowing for so many people that it actually can be a preventative, helpful mineral if you have kidney disease, because that's not what you hear. In fact, it's like so wild, it almost like feels wrong, but it's true, right? <laughs> this, is, <Yep. laughs> this is recent. But look at these six different pathways where they talk about. Now, I don't, I don't think I've, maybe once in a blue moon recommended potassium supplementation every once in a while for um, metabolic acidosis. But uh, I want to think about this from a potassium rich diet. Mm. The recommendation in the States is like more than 4,500 milligrams and no one meets that ever, ever. It's really, really kind of crazy, but that's what you should get. So here's a couple of thoughts here. So blood pressure. Now this one we already know. 
all the science on blood pressure, if you look at the DASH diet, Mediterranean diet, whatever, they saw the greatest benefit in blood pressure reduction on a, a, a sodium modified high potassium diet. Mm -hmm. So where blood pressure is such a huge like punch on the kidneys, like it's really a big hit if your blood pressure stays high. If you're taking out potassium from your diet, which can help modify that and help, you actually can be hurting yourself, right? You could actually be causing more harm than good, but it helps with your urinary sodium excretion. And I love that, right? That uh, sodium actually, potassium and sodium have this inverse relationship. So uh, potassium actually helps you get sodium out. So really helpful there. And it helps um, with this vascular tone decrease. So blood pressure, like number one place that blood, that a potassium rich diet can be helpful. Risk of stroke decreases, decreases atherosclerosis. Again, like here's blood pressure, it goes down. Um, on osteoporosis, you see that a higher potassium diet is going to buffer the acids. It's going to de it's going to decrease your urinary calcium excretion. So you're not going to be pouring calcium into your blood, mm -hmm. um, which also causes cardiac issues for people with kidney disease, but also you can be able to keep your bone strong, like bone mineral disease is a huge deal in kidney disease. So potassium helps balance that out, right? It helps keep even your bones strong. Uh, nephrolithiasis, right? So these are your kidney stones. Um, potassium is a huge part of preventing kidney stones. And I believe you had uh, Dr. Wimes on here a, a little while back. He loves to talk about kidney stones and like how important the minerals and the citrate are. But if you just look at kidney stones, if you have a potassium rich diet, right, you're going to have a decrease in this urinary calcium and this ur urate excretion, which is huge, not just because kidney stones are incredibly painful, but because more kidney stones is also linked to a higher prevalence of kidney disease. So, yeah. which makes sense, you know, it's got a sharp, shard like, you know, rock in your kidneys is going to cause some damage if you have them over and over and over again. Um, you're also going to increase your urinary citrate excretion. Uh, cardio protection with high potassium diets. Again, like you look at some of the, the research on Mediterranean diets, DASH diets, where there's tons of fruits and vegetables, um, decrease arrhythmia, decrease heart attack, decrease mortality. Like people are living longer. And this is the number one cause of death in kidney disease, right? Cardiovascular. So huge. And then just on progression of kidney disease, so many people, I mean, everybody that is diagnosed with kidney disease uh, wants to keep their kidneys strong. They don't want to end up on dialysis. If they can avoid a transplant, they want to avoid that and just keep their native kidneys. Yeah. So if you look at potassium right there, it decreases metabolic acidosis, which is a driver of kidney disease. It decreases inflammation and fibrosis. I think fibrosis is probably one of the hardest things to tackle in kidney disease. One thing I actually I really love about your products is it tackles that fibrosis angle, but um, potassium, it's one of the nutrients that can help tackle that. So this is my case. <laughs> I think we should be very, very cautious of when we exclude potassium because it is a wonderful important mineral to keep in our diet. Yeah, totally, totally agree with that. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's just such an important thing to, to show. Now, you were going to talk about some guidelines um, about potassium, and I think that was also out of New Zealand, wasn't it? You had another amazing... Yes, app. yes. Yeah, I might have got those ones mixed up, but um, let me pull this up as well. So I pulled up these two articles before because I just thought they were so... So excellent. Okay, so this is from, uh, okay, so this is June 2020, oh, sorry, published online February 2022. So again, this year, right, this is a commentary on the KDOKI guidelines. So for those of you that maybe are not familiar with KDOKI, I always describe it, and it's uh, KDOKI stands for the Kidney Disease Outcomes Quality, maybe Initiative, I can't remember what the I stands for, yeah, but fine. Kedoki is the researchers who research the research. 
So it has been about uh, maybe 20 years <laughs> since, since this was updated. So tw when this came out in 2020, it was like a really big deal, updated guidelines on nutrition and clinical practice guidelines for kidney disease. Um, and Kadoki is, you know, the, the American organization. So what they do is they look at all the studies that they have, especially recently, and they kind of rate them for quality and, you know, what were their endpoints and, you know, how, you know, how good was this study, how many people, et cetera. And then they make recommendations based on that. So to me, I really think that a lot of the time these carry a lot of weight and definitely they carry a lot of weight with medical professionals. This is where, you know, we don't have time to read hundreds of papers and rate them or anything like these people do. So we depend on these guidelines to help us. Now, this is a commentary on the guidelines. And I just wanted to share this one paragraph on potassium, phosphorus, and sodium intake, because I thought it was so excellently written for the most part. So what they say is if you look at the KDOKI guidelines, they're saying it's now recommended in KDOKI prior to the guidelines from 20 years ago, and thank goodness we're finally updating them, that dietary potassium and phosphorus intake should be individualized in adults with CKD 3 to 5 three to five D, which five D is on dialysis mm -hmm. and post-transplant with hyperkalemia. Like as a dietitian, we were like, hallelujah. <laughs> like finally, <laughs> we, like we can say that not every person needs to be educated on a low potassium diet. Uh, like this was, this was really, really great <laughs> for us. Yes. What they said, the, the new guidelines, they say they're far less prescriptive. So when I was thought to be a dietitian, we're like, okay, kidney disease, Everyone has 2,000 milligrams of potassium a day. I had to write it in their chart. <laughs> I remember doing this over and over again. It was boring as heck because everyone got the same prescription. It took like no brain power, just 2,000 milligrams of kidney disease. But now they say there's not a prescription, right? It's just very individualized. Mm. And instead, I love this part, right? that um, these foods should not be restricted as they offer other benefits that are beneficial to people with CKD, mm -hmm. right? We don't want to be restricting all of these amazing fruits, vegetables, whole grains, bread, cereals, legumes that look like they have tons of potassium because they have tons of other benefits. And they actually didn't even see in the research, it made a difference to restrict them. Yeah. So no evidence of that. So that's the part that I I just I wanted to share. I thought it was a really good, um, a really good summary. And they kind of summed it up by saying, um, if hyperkalemia cannot be reversed on occasion, like you know, we acknowledge that on occasion it's you can't figure out why, um, then a sensible dietary restriction is encouraged. Mm -hmm. Sensible, I mean individualized. I can tell you that probably probably 100%, 100% of my patients still eat avocado. Yeah. Like that's a good, healthy fat. We use it all the time, unless they don't like it. Most of them it's in all of our regular menus. We use it all the time. So a sensible dietary restriction. So that's what I wanted to share on that. Cause I think it's just been a uh, really, really um, just a really important topic to get clarity on. And the new guidelines are not even if you read it on Mayo Clinic, even if you read it on DaVita's website, National Kidney Foundation, it doesn't matter what the source is. If A lot of them have not updated their web pages <laughs> since they came out. And so the top 10 on Google is not accurate. No. Not every person with kidney disease needs a restriction. And to add to that, potassium does not hurt the kidneys. It doesn't hurt the kidneys. It's not going to cause decline. In fact, it actually can be helpful. Yeah, they actually can prevent that. I like what they'd said in that paper too, that clinicians should actively search for the cause of high hyperkalemia. Yes. Treat that. Yes. And only if that can't be treated and addressed, then a potentially sensible um, restriction of potassium without removing it altogether. So yeah. And no, I'll tell you, one of, that, I'll, I'll te um, one of the things we coach our patients on is that if they get a lab back and potassium is high, there's still a knee-jerk response. It's really hard to weed out old practice from the medical field. 
there's a knee jerk response by many physicians and even some dietitians say, okay, well, you need to cut out potatoes, oranges, tomatoes, sweet potatoes, bananas, and they like blah, 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 off the list of high potassium yep. foods. Mm -hmm. And then let's test your potassium and come back. So we coach our patients <laughs> to do a stop on that, right? And not in a rude way, but you say, you know, so I would say it, you know, like, okay, doctor, so-and-so. So if it's not one of those things, what else would it be? Like, what else do you think could be going on if it's not, if I'm not actually eating more potassium? Just, I just want to know your thoughts there. That's the phrase we'll coach our patients on. And then the doctor will start being able to leverage their amazing skill set to start thinking through, well, you know, it could be this or this, or and they can flush it out. Sometimes you do have to challenge uh, your physician or your dietitian just a little bit to think outside of the dietary place because it's the easiest one to pin the problem on. And it's usually not the problem. I'm so glad you said that. And I think that's a question that, um, you know, people will get asked is how do we address this with our professionals? So you said one thing, if a lab comes back that they can challenge around the foods and things, but how would someone that goes, okay, well, I've listened to this and my nephrologist has had me on a potassium reduced diet for years and I've got cardiovascular disease. So I'm actually increasing my risk. I'm only stage maybe two maybe heading to stage three, maybe I've accelerated it because I've taken all these great foods out. How does someone then have that conversation with their specialist? Do they take in the latest research and say, you know, Kadoki's actually up, 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 you know, changed the guidelines around this. Have, are you aware that that's changed? What would you suggest that people say to their professionals? That's a, that's a great question. So I think one of the most effective strategies to challenge a current treatment approach in a partnership basis with your doctor, right? Mm -hmm. uh, any physician, clinician, any clinician patient relationship should be a partnership is to do an experiment or a trial. <laughs> I think that really works the best. And I mean, even with our patients who've been on a restrictive potassium diet for a while, I, you know, and they're like right on the borderline area, I feel just a little bit cautious on being like, okay, just eat however much potassium you want. I am a little bit worried it's gonna just put their potassium through the roof. It's a, it's slightly unreasonable really, but I also don't wanna be the cause of someone ending up in the hospital with hyperkalemia. So the experiment that I think is really nice here is you'll say, okay, how about if we add in some high potassium foods you're really missing and then we'll get your blood drawn in a week or two weeks because mm -hmm. you're not gonna have any problems within a week or two. And that's what we'll do. And you can do that even with your physician. You're like, I've been on this really restrictive diet for a while. I heard or I read or somewhere that potassium is not, you know, dietary potassium isn't the biggest impact. I'd love to try adding some foods in. And then can I get an order to just get my blood drawn in a week or so? And we'll see where I'm at. And most physicians are very amicable to that. And they're fine with like, yeah, let's just try it and see where it goes. So. And, if someone, and if someone wanted to put in some good potassium foods, I know avocado is my go-to as a favorite, but what, what ones would you say, okay, someone's been on a really restricted potassium diet. We're going to, we're going to do exactly that. What foods are your favorites to put back in that have got such a great beneficial effect on the kidneys, cardiovascular system, and pancreas? Oh, there's so many, honestly, an experiment like that. I'll just share a few favorites, but experiment like that, I usually ask what people are missing the most. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of times it's honestly the most common one that people are really missing is sweet potatoes and wow. yams surprisingly because they just they were eating those and it was part of their healthy diet and then they cut it out because they thought it was a problem and they really are excited to add that back in um but avocados I agree that's one of my favorite ones to add in at the beginning um a couple others that I really, I do like to add in the tuberous, like root vegetables. I love beets. Mm. Um, if we're not following an oxalate restriction, I think they have tons of other amazing benefits. So that's one of my favorites. Oxide, yeah. 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 The nitric oxide is just so incredible for, uh, for kidney disease. So I really like using beets. Mm. Uh, if people like them, some people got real strong feelings about beets, <laughs> but um, yeah, beets are one that I really love to add. 
Um, I have a lot of people that really love to add in mango. It's quite a sweet fruit. It's got a pretty high fructose content. It's not my go-to, but a lot of people like it in their smoothie. Um, so that's one that we'll add in sometimes. Um, I'm trying to think through, like in this case, I was bring up my list and then we pick out a couple high mm -hmm. potassium ones. There's a few greens that, um, a little bit higher in potassium. Um, and so we'll add those and I love adding in greens if we can. Yeah. So, tomatoes are another one that get a bad rap too. Oh not. yeah. Toma tomatoes. Yeah. I love tomatoes are also a common one. People are like, yes, like spaghetti sauce or <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So is there anything else that you want to add to this potassium? And I'm not going to call it a debate because really the scientific literature is pretty good there that I, I think it's not a debate anymore. It's just people are really outdated with the latest research and, and those sort of things. So I'm going to say it's that instead. Is there anything else you want to add to that? Um, and it's not to convince people they have to put potassium back in, but I guess my point is, not only has potassium got a bad rap, but it actually is protective and preventative. And so it's not about just tipping it back to the midline. It's about tipping it maybe back in there as being an important food to have in your diet. Yeah. Um, that's probably all the thing I would want to add. Is there anything that you want to add to the... Yeah, I guess the other issue uh, that has come up in the last several years, uh, maybe in the last, I don't know how long they've been on the market, but is now there are a couple medications that are potassium binders. Mm. And that is the other default recommendation of many physicians. If your potassium is high, uh, usually they'll do two blood draws. I don't see it usually on the first blood draw, thank goodness. But if it's more than once, they'll say, oh, well, you should be on a potassium binder. And so they'll give people a potassium binding medication. Now, uh, the rationale is, well, if we put them on this, then they can keep their diet very liberal. And so we, you know, so it's going to just help people live a more normal life and, you know, get all those other nutrients that are in these high potassium foods. And so that's how we're going to treat it. Very, very accepted and very common practice. Potassium binders were genius by whoever <laughs> invented them because they fit perfectly in the medical model of see a lab value number off, so add a medication. That's like the linear thinking, right? This lab value is off, add a medication. It brings it down, problem is solved. Now, potassium binders can have a place and certainly they definitely taste better than the old school way of reducing hyperkalemia, which was uh, drinking K-exalate, which is extremely gross. But my caution on using potassium binders is that if you have a blood value that's high and you treat it with a medication, when there are other underlying causes, you haven't actually treated the problem. And potassium binders do not only bind potassium. And so I think that they have a place I think they're, you know, I think every medication can have a place at certain spots, but the first, I don't think they are the best first line therapy for a high potassium in the blood. I really, really think that every medical professional should be looking at root cause before they add in the medication. So that's the other issue surrounding potassium that is honestly very, very recent in the last, I don't know, five to 10 years or so. Yeah, no, it's a really good point. And it's, it comes back to what we always talk about is to treat the person, not the disease and the cause, not the yeah. effect. And that is how you will have an effective um, stab at reducing, reversing um, kidney disease. If you don't take out what we would call the drivers of what's driving the pathology of the disease, it's like driving with your accelerator on the foot and the brake at the same time. You're just going to spin your wheels. You can take medication that's stopping stuff, but you're still pouring stuff into the system that's causing inflammation, potentially causing um, sclerosis into the uh, and damage into the um, tubules, which is what drives a lower EGFR, all of those sort of things. So um, medications are great. I find short term to stop something while you address potentially the cause of what's going on and then actually fixing lifestyle and all of those sort of things. So I think that's a good point. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Yeah. So, but that, that's it. That's the only other point about potassium other than that. I just hundred percent agree with you that I, I feel like we should be at a point 
in the medical practice now that we embrace potassium <laughs> and sort of demonize it yeah and like really put on our thinking caps with what what drives that up and understand you know the pathways that that impact those electrolyte imbalances yeah for sure no thank you jesse and i really appreciate your expertise on this it was funny when we first got into this field and emily and i used to think we used to get scathing emails from renal dietitians about how dare we our diets have got potassium in it and we're like well it's alkalizing is more important than actually did you know potassium is not that bad but they're just you know like you say the schooling and everything that people go through and it takes i think is it what's the theory 20 years from when a paper comes out for the medical research to Update. So we're not probably going to see the training for renal dietitians and things around this change for a little while. So um, this is why, you know, I really wanted to get Jesse Anna on today to have this discussion again, because it's something that we stumble, I stumble across it in comments on YouTube, comments on Facebook, emails that we get. Why have you still got potassium? You know, someone um, when you were sharing your screen, they're like, well, there's so many high potassium foods in there, but we're like, yeah, they're so good for you. So we just... We wanted to have this conversation that potassium is a friend, not a foe, especially when it comes to kidney disease, unless it is indicated on a blood draw. And again, make sure you have two blood draws. And in my experience, and it sounds like Jesse Anna's as well, I think I've seen it twice and I would, I've treated thousands and thousands and thousands of people with kidney disease, Jesse Anna probably. Yeah. So, um, and it's a very uncommon blood marker to see, and it will have a other cause behind it, be it medication, which is probably the one we should probably see the most, right? It'd be medication induced. hundred percent. Medication is the number one driver. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so that's our um, loving contribution to potassium. If potassium, if you're out there, we love you. <laughs> <laughs> and um Jessiana, thanks again. Again, I always appreciate your brain and um just your input and all of those sort of things. So thanks for joining us. Now remember, if you want more information about Jessiana and her team, I'll put it down below. But she's the kidney nutrition institute um, .org. Um, and yes. you can go on there and there's um I put in the last um, YouTube video that we did the link to her community where you can get some great downloads. You can join that community on a subscription fee where you'll get great uh, connection to others, some amazing um, recipes and dietary download. If you want to work with a renal dietitian um, and a group of experts that are up to date with the latest research and are really thinking outside the box and treating you as a person, then Jessie Anna and anyone on her team, um, they're amazing. You've got Lindsay and um, a few others in there, Kimberly, I think, that are all really great. Nicole, there's a whole bunch of them that just work together that are, are really fabulous. So check them out. If you want to know more about what we do, head to www.kidneycoach.com. We've got the kidney disease solution in there. It's got a full dietary plan that's alkalizing with some potassium foods in there. <laughs> and then of course, we've got kidney advance and kidney prime. Uh, they're part of our protocol to help protect the kidneys. Um, make sure you hit subscribe. That means you'll get notified anytime we put out new content and you can also head to our Facebook page as well. Thanks for being part of our community. Again, thanks, Jessiana, so much for your contribution to everything that we're doing. And we look forward to talking to you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.